been a, an, an eventful summer, I think, in, in a range of ways. And not, not least, actually, you know, leaving aside Brexit and, and the, the turmoil on, on the markets for the pound and, and the political turmoil, it's actually been quite a, an eventful um, summer in, in the cybersecurity world as well. Um, most well, we had recently one of the largest breaches of, of uh, uh, login data, um, and just a couple of weeks ago we had the internet's ever uh, biggest ever distributed denial of service attack, uh, an attack on on a um, cybersecurity uh, blogger and and expert and and somebody who who has worked quite hard to put some of the criminals behind bars. Uh, there was a revenge attack on his, his website. He's Brian Krebs. He runs a website, Krebs on Security. Uh, and he got hit by a terabit per second of, of data thrown at, at the website. Um, and despite the fact that he got all kinds of defences there, it just completely overwhelmed everything that, uh, that he could do to, to deflect it. The really interesting thing about the attack was that the the vector for the attack, the machines that were attacking him, uh, were um, CCTV cameras and video recorders, uh, which people had connected to the internet and had not changed the default usernames and passwords. And so there's a botnet out there with the capability of launching that kind of attack, built out of essentially you know, early parts of the internet of things. And if you're, if you're running any devices that have got default usernames and passwords, can I exhort you to go home and change the default password? Because the, the code that recruited that botnet has been released on the internet. Uh, all the usernames and passwords are in plain, so it's easy to update them to, to your favorite uh, usernames and passwords for, for the defaults of particular systems you might want to attack. And therefore, a lot of people will be doing that, I don't doubt. So if you've got internet-connected devices that have got default passwords that you haven't changed, it would be a jolly good idea if you change them. Um, there's, there's even some real concern that you know, this, this level of attack and, and the fact that we are going to get more devices in, in the Internet of Things could, could lead to some radical changes to the internet. And some people have even considered this an existential issue for the internet. So it's, it's been an interesting summer. I, I want to talk about personal data, about controlling personal data. It's, it's said that if you're not paying for a service on the internet, then you're not the customer for it, you're the product. And I want to explore whether that's true, what it means. And I'm going to use as an example uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Google mainly, but a lot of what I say will apply to a very wide range of other websites. And a lot of it will, pay to, uh, will, will, will apply to, to paying websites, to, to websites that are, are you know, genuinely part of Shops Amazon, for example, because they need the personal data for a, for a whole range of reasons as well. So that it, it reads across to a, to a lot more. I'm not specifically criticizing uh, these, the social media sites that I will be talking about, although they do provide a, a wonderfully powerful example of the things that I want to say. Let's start with some numbers. Um, that's, that's Facebook's reported figures, uh, revenue of, of $6 billion, profits of, of a couple of billion dollars, nearly 2 billion monthly active users, market value of, of $350 billion. Each user, therefore, you can calculate, is worth more than $200 to the shareholders and is generating uh, a bit over a dollar and a half of, of profit every three months. Um, Twitter, um, smaller, make a loss, actually. Um, 313 million monthly active users. The, these figures, I've, the transcript gives all the references for this, this data. There are lots of different ways of assessing these, the, the number of monthly active users, and different marketing organizations use different measures. 
So if you're looking at the Financial Times over the weekend, for example, you'll see a completely different set of, of numbers for, for the number of active users. But I've, I've given you the reference to where I got the data from. So if you want to follow it up, you can, you can see um, whether you want to believe this data or somebody else's. But this is just, just really indicative. You know, even in, in a company where each user is actually costing the company a third of a dollar every three months, each user is still worth $38 to shareholders. Um, these are the kind of prices that were paid for, for companies that have been traded um, within in the last few years. Just again, to give you some idea that the number of active users is a major factor in valuing these companies. The, the values that are being placed on them are much more than, than any company would pay for the staff or the intellectual property or their software or any of their intangibles or any of their tangible assets. It's the users that, that really create the value in these sort of companies. And, and part of the reason for that is, is the network effect. The more users you've, you've got, the more users you get because of the number of interactions going up exponentially as, as you add users. So people tend to, to cluster together. That's, that's why you get big winners in social media sites, for example, and some of the social media sites just fall away and, and effectively die. So if you're paying that amount of money to buy users, you need to be able to turn the users into profit. And that process of monetization is um, quite often, very largely through uh, advertising, through uh, getting revenue from the users or from advertisers by using, by selling the access to the users you've got. And they'll pay for access. You, uh, advertisers will pay for access to the users, but only if they can make money out of it, obviously, because they, they need people to do something as a result of the advertisement. Otherwise, they can't afford to go on paying for the advertising. So targeting advertising is absolutely critical to these values. Showing the, the most targeted adverts to the best selected group of people to show those adverts to is what creates the money. Facebook advertising, one, one very good example of, of how it's working successfully. How do they do targeting? They, this is what they say about how you can target your ads if you're an advertiser. You can reach your customers in the area where they live or where they do business with you. You can target by country, county, postcode, the area around your business. You can choose the demographics by, by age, gender, by interests. We'll come back to that. By the languages they speak. The interest you can choose from hundreds of categories. Um, we'll have a look at a, a few of those in a minute just to give you some examples. You can do it by behaviours. You can base the targeting on the things that they do, such as their shopping behaviour, the kind of phone that they use, uh, whether they're looking to, to buy a particular thing that you may be wishing to sell. You can reach people who, who like certain things, and you can reach other people like them, particularly their contacts, their, their network of people. Uh, Facebook will let you target the ads in that way as well. And then they've signed up with a number of partners to um, people like Experian uh, and a number of, of other market research organisations to use the data that they can get from publicly available sources or, or uh, sources that are only available to them to enable this targeting to, to be done even more effectively. Uh, these descriptions, uh, again, the, the reference to them is in the transcript that you can pick up or which will be on, online in due course. Facebook charges by, by results. So uh, the advertiser agrees a fee, uh, says what they're willing to pay for, for a like, for a click through onto a web page, for any of the other actions that, that Facebook offers to advertisers as things that they can put on the ads and, and which they, they can then um, get charged for. So Facebook income depends on showing the right adverts to the best targeted people. And again, as we shall see, 
keeping them online so that they keep looking at the adverts, keep seeing the adverts, keep having the opportunity to generate revenue for Facebook. So what adverts do you, do you get to see if, if you're a Facebook user? Well, the ones that maximise the revenue to, to the advertisers and, and to Facebook, which you would hope would be the ones that interest you most as well. So it can be presented to you as we're doing you a favour, we're only showing you the adverts you're interested in, but of course the underlying motivation is generating as much revenue as possible. So Facebook algorithms calculate a value for each advertisement and then when you go onto a page, in real time, an auction is, is conducted between all the advertisements that could be shown in order to display to you the ones that are most likely to generate an action by you that will generate revenue. Google does, does much the same with, with Google AdWords, uh, a mechanism that, that enables Google to select the advertisements that are, are being shown to you. Um, you select a, a set of keywords of of phrases. These are the ones that Google would suggest to you if you're selling a cybersecurity product. I typed in cybersecurity. These were the proposals. And, and down the right hand side is a list of, of Google's estimate of the relative number of people who will uh, actually look for, they'll search for that phrase uh, in a month. And again, the advertiser sets the fee that they're willing to pay Google for somebody clicking through uh, as a result of seeing their advertisement. Um, and, and they set a daily budget to make sure that, that they don't you know, suddenly get runaway success and bankrupt themselves by accident. And, and again, a real-time auction occurs. And I'll show you Google's explanation of, of that in, in just a moment. And it determines which ads show and the order in which they show on the page, just, just where they are on, on the page. So this is Google's explanation that AdWords finds all the ads that match the search terms. And then it selects those that are eligible to be shown. Uh, so it, it eliminates those that um, have been disapproved. They actually screen every, every advert that is, is put forward to make sure you know, it's not obscene or illegal or um, trying to, to sell something in a country where that would be illegal to be sold and those sorts of things. And, and they rate the advertisements as well on the basis of how effective they think they will be. And then they construct an ad rank, a combination of how much you've bid for that particular ad word the quality of the advertisement, in, in their view, informed by their algorithms and, and perhaps by some personal inspection, uh, and the expected impact of, of other things that are embedded in your advertisement, the various extensions and you know, events and likes and various things that you can put in, or videos that you can embed. And then they run this real-time auction. So in, in those fractions of a second while an, an, an ad, while a search is being processed and the results page is being constructed, this process takes place. Um, that's why they need so many server farms running, running Google. There is an, an enormous amount of processing going on at very, very high speeds to do it. It's hugely impressive technology. How, how do they do the targeting? Well, they are assigning, don't forget, a weighting depending on how successful they think the advertisement is going to be. So targeting on the base of personal data matters to Google as well. And they, they use things that you search for because they've got your search history. And you may rem remember from my last lecture on the, the anonymization one where we looked at the file of search histories that AOL had made available to researchers, just how revealing that history of searches can actually be about the sort of person somebody is, what their interests are, 
their state of mind, their, their activities, and so on. And all those other things, websites that you visit, videos that you watch, uh, your location, Google Maps, don't forget. Every time you use it, they know where you are and where you're going. Um, IP address, cookie data, information about your device, and other data that, that you've provided. Um, all the things that, that you provided when you actually signed up to Google, but also emails that you send and receive on Gmail. Um, photos and videos that you upload. Um, documents and sheets and slides that you've chosen to store on Google Drive. Google tells, tells its users, of course, that it scans these things. You know, it, it makes it perfectly clear. There's, there's nothing, nothing hidden about this. It's completely open if you, if you dig through the um, privacy data, the, the things that everybody signs up to when they tick the box saying we're, we're quite happy to accept your terms and conditions. But it does mean that, that everything that you're sharing is getting analysed and being used in this sort of way. Uh, and potentially in other sorts of ways, but that's, that's um, outside the scope of, of this talk, perhaps. And they explain that they do indeed use it for, for targeting advertisements. How much personal data do social media sites collect? I mean, there's a, a series of cases kicked off by, by an Australian law student, Max Schrems, um, running through the European courts at the moment. Um, and and he, he forced Facebook to, to provide him with all the information that Facebook held on him. This was some years ago. Uh, and it had 1,200 pages of uh, a PDF with 1,200 pages of, of data that they had kept, including, as you can see, deleted chat conversations, um, event inv invitations that he didn't respond to, um, lots of, of data that he hadn't appreciated was being saved. Uh, and, and it said that uh, those 1,200 pages only contained data from 23 out of the 84 categories that, that Facebook holds. Well, we've seen on an earlier slide that Facebook says they, they now have hundreds of, of categories that, that they offer to advertisers. So there's presumably uh, potentially more data being, being kept. Uh, captured and, uh, and which presumably you could obtain if you put in a, um, a, a data subject access request to Facebook. Probably have to come on a DVD these days, wouldn't it? It wouldn't fit on a CD. So who owns all that data? Now, the, the terms and conditions mostly um, say that the, the sites that you use can use your personal data any way they like and you, you click on it because you want to use the site and you never read the, the privacy policy uh, if you're like 99% of, uh, of internet users. That, that may be fine for, for this level of personal data. You may, may feel quite, quite comfortable about that. There, there are other issues about ownership of personal data which um, it, it's worth just mentioning in passing uh, getting access to, to data when somebody dies can actually be really quite a challenge. Families find that, that um, you know, a loved one has, has died and their personal photographs are no longer accessible to them because the, they, they don't have the, the login details for the, for the website where they've been stored. And getting hold of those photographs, which may be very important to the family, can be really very difficult. And it's not just photographs, it may be legal documents that have been stored online. And even the executors don't, don't have ready access. I mean, a number of the major social media sites in particular are now setting up um, special policies for handling uh, requests from, from bereaved people and, and trying to make this as, as easy as possible. But there are some interesting issues here, and there's a, a, a reference there to a, a legal paper on, on some of the issues that, that arise should you happen to want to follow any of this up. Um, if, if you want to explore 
what Facebook knows about you at, at the highest level, then you can just look it up. You know, log into Facebook, go to, uh, to facebook.com ads preferences, and, and there's a, a range of, of the categories. Um, and many of those categories have got, got subcategories as well. I mean, this is just a, uh, a set for a, for a particular individual. Um, there's an increasing interest now in not just targeting advertisements by what you're interested in, but by how you're feeling at the moment. Because advertisers have realised that people are more likely to buy particular things when they're in a particular mood, and therefore showing them an advertisement when they're feeling in that sort of mood is more likely to have an effect. Um, this, this came from a, a patent application from Apple, and is, is indicative of, of how important major companies are finding it to, to look into um, monitoring mood in, in various ways. And they, they talk about collecting mood data from um, body sensors to monitor heart rate, blood pressure, and, and so on. And you start thinking about, you know, fitness gadgets that, that people are, are increasingly wearing and linking into, into their phones, for example, and recording health data on their, on their phones. Um, behavioural characteristics, how, how you're interacting with devices, apps that you're launching, those sorts of things. Um, and a, a range of information sources that may be used in real time to, to judge what kind of mood you're in. Uh, there's been interest in uh, Spotify has been, been also um, looking at, at providing mood information because it's, it's useful to Spotify as well. Um, Google has put in a, a patent application to actually, it, it seems, use um, Google Glass or, or some later piece of technology to enable them to, to sell pay-by-gaze advertising, where the advertiser actually pays the Google for every time that you perhaps look at an advertisement, a billboard or an advertisement on the underground, um, by detecting what, what you're looking at. And again, perhaps using uh, mood sensing uh, information to, to gauge what impact that advertisement had on you. They, they talk about the inferred emotional state um, in order that the advertiser can, can gauge the success of, of their advertising campaign. Um, and of course, you, you can tell quite a lot from how long people look at something, whether they look at it and then come back to it. So this, it's interesting, I think, to see the way in which major companies are at least thinking about these issues and, and deciding that, that it's worth um, establishing a position in the market by, by taking out or uh, applying for patents. Now, if mood matters and, and it's successful, might companies decide that they wanted to manipulate your mood in order to put you in a mood that would be beneficial to the advertisements that they were showing you. That's, that's clearly a possibility. And, and this is a, an experiment that, that created quite a, quite a bit of fuss when it, when it was um, reported. Um, this is from, from the Washington Post. Facebook experimented by, by tweaking the newsfeed algorithms of, uh, of getting on for 700,000 people for a week and, and showing half of them fewer positive posts than, than usual and half of them fewer negative posts than, than usual. And then monitoring what effect it had by looking at the positive words that people used in status updates and, and those sorts of things. Uh, and there was, it said, uh, a pretty clear relationship. Uh, this was published in a peer-reviewed um, psychology journal. Um, so you can, you can actually see the, the peer-reviewed paper that, that reports on, on all of this and explains the, the correlations and why it's considered significant. 
So it, it's clear that companies could manipulate mood. We've seen already that they're interested. Um, and this seems to indicate that, at the very least, somebody in, in Facebook at the time was, was considering that, that this was worth experimenting with in order to, uh, to establish the extent to which it could be done. And many people don't realise that their, their Facebook news feed is, is, in any case, heavily edited. I mean, if it wasn't, you'd potentially be swamped with, with stuff. So, uh, again, Washington Post experiment, uh, you know, getting on for three quarters of, of the new material that, that your friends and, and subscribe pages put up, you never get to see. Uh, always a good excuse, of course. Um, when, when you're accused of not paying attention, it's not your fault. And, and it turns out that certainly, you know, even amongst the really um, internet-savvy student population, a um, great majority of people didn't realise that, that there was any screening of posts, that, that the, the news feed that they were getting was being edited. And then you look at where Americans get their news from, and there's a, there's a big difference be between the, the millennials and, and my generation, the baby boomers, where, where there is a much greater tendency for people to get their news now from, from social media than, than from the more um, conventional news sources. So you, you create a, a situation where people's view of the world is actually very much governed by that news feed that we've just seen is in any case being, being screened, algorithmically, of course, in, in the main. I mean, you... Facebook hasn't got millions of people going through everybody's news feed and say, oh, they won't want to see that one. You know, Joe got very cross last time we showed him. <laughs> Nothing like that. But the algorithms um, will, I imagine, be completely confidential and, and will change in any case quite, quite often and um, may have some machine learning embedded in them. That's an issue we, we may come back to because... Um, machine learning systems are, in general, very bad at explaining why they have come to a conclusion rather than, than simply doing it. So even the people who've developed the systems can actually be pretty unsure as to what the criteria are that are being used. And this, this creates what, what has been called the filter bubble, that... Because social media sites want people to, to be happy, they want them to stay online, they want to provide a service that their customers are happy with, um, what they do is they show them more of the things that they like. So when you say that you're interested in something, when you like something, when you click on something, and, and it's recorded, it affects what you see next. And so increasingly, the things that you see reinforce the opinions that you already had. And because you get shown things that your friends like in particular, you end up with clusters of people who reinforce each other's views, who share the same views and are increasingly reinforcing those views. So there is an argument that, that this is actually creating effects in society that perhaps are, are not expected and, and may not be, be wholly benign. I mean, it's a, it's a massive social experiment that is happening as the side effect of an entirely commercial operation. At least, let's assume it's entirely commercial. Um, does it matter? There was a... A researcher looked at what happened when, when you Google the term BP, and depending, you know, two, two different people, one, one gets links to investment news about BP, and the other one gets links to news stories about the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, it, it suggests that these things 
could be swinging people's attitudes in quite major ways. Um, this, this is a, a, all a quote from the MIT Technology Review. Again, reference in the, in the transcript. And, and what that says is the danger is it can polarise populations and create potentially harmful divisions in society. So it's, it's an interesting phenomenon and, and one that, that we, we perhaps need to watch out for and, and perhaps to isolate ourselves from to, to some extent, or at the very least to try to find ways of, of ensuring that we understand if we're falling into the trap of, of being manipulated by only seeing the things that we already agree with. Of course, it, you know, this is a phenomenon that occurs anyway. Most people buy a newspaper that shares their political views, if they buy a newspaper at all. And so, you know, you do get that, that level of, of reinforcement. It's, it's a, a rare Guardian reader who, who forces themselves to read the Daily Mail in order to make sure they're getting a balanced view of the world. <laughs> How much control should you want to take control over, over what's happening to your personal data? What, what can you do about it? Uh, well, there's some, some things you can do. I mean, I, I, I do these things. Um, I, I use, as I've said before, I use startpage.com as my search engine because it, it does all the searches through Google, but it does it through a proxy so that all Google sees is that Startpage is doing those searches and it can't relate them back to me, so it can't produce a list of my searches. Um, and, and it also offers a link to a proxy link to the website. So if, if one of the links is to a website that you feel, for example, may have some malware on it that you don't trust for some reason, you can, you can click on the proxy link and, and then um, the, the website is actually opened by Startpage and displayed to you, so there's no danger of anything getting thrown into your computer. I use the, the Firefox browser, I didn't mean to do that. I use the Firefox browser, uh, which I set to, to private browsing, so that no history is kept, all cookies are cleared at the end of, of every browsing session. That makes it very difficult for websites to know that I've been looking at the same website time and again. Uh, and I run it with a, with a couple of, of ad blockers. I've done it again. Um, Ghostery and, and Privacy Badger in particular, and I disable JavaScript and only choose to run scripts that I trust on websites that I trust. Now that's a pain, um, and you probably think it's paranoid. Um, and maybe I am paranoid, but then, then most cybersecurity researchers um, put a bit of sticky tape or, or a torn off corner of a post-it note over their web cameras on their laptops. You can recognise uh, somebody who's serious about security because they've, they've got their, their webcam taped off because they know that it's possible to spy on people through their webcams. And if you hand them a USB stick, you, you'll see them throw it in the bin. Um, they're the people who, when you go to a conference and the conference proceedings are given to you on a USB stick, chuck it in the bin. Uh, I've actually stood in conferences and watched to see what about 1% of people, people do that. I'm one of them. I went to a, to a major financiers conference, infrastructure finance conference in, in, in Berlin. Uh, Angela Merkel was speaking, Jean-Claude Juncker was speaking. There were I don't know, 300 serious finance executives in the room. And believe it or not, they handed out all the slides on USB sticks made in China. <laughs> Most young US internet users use an ad blocker. I'm not alone, you see. Um, only 36% only don't use one at all. About a, a third use one on the desktop, 17% on a mobile, and 14% on, on both. So there is a growing um, recognition that ad blockers are a good, a good thing. Um, this, is, this is very recent. This is it's about a week, week, two weeks ago at most. Uh, this, this came out 
um, from uh, Kaspersky, the uh, um, antivirus and security people. Um, they, they encountered a gratuitous act of violence against Android users by simply viewing their favorite news sites. Um, they can end up downloading a banking trojan. And what had happened was that the malicious program had been put into an advertisement that was being distributed by the Google AdSense advertising network. And in order to download the Trojan onto your computer and therefore have it stealing your, your bank details if you happen to do uh, internet banking on your phone, which I wouldn't recommend, um, all you had to do was to open the page that displayed the ad. You didn't have to click on it. Just looking at the page that had that ad displayed on it was enough to compromise your telephone. That's why I use an ad blocker. Just going to a website with a malicious advert can infect your phone or, or your computer. Now, this sort of data isn't just used to advertise to you. It's used to affect the prices that, that you see, for example. Um, quite often, I don't know if you, you may have noticed it, you, know, you go looking for a hotel room. Um, you, you look at a, a comparison website, you go and look at a, uh, another comparison website, you look at various ho hotel websites. You've, you've got a mental note or you've made a note of where you saw the, the room that you're interested in, the cheapest offer. You go back to it and it's gone. And they're offering you a higher, higher priced one. Maybe, maybe they really do only have one, one room. I mean, some of the websites say, you know, 16 people are looking at this and 14 of them have booked rooms in the last two seconds. And so maybe, maybe it's true. I don't believe it, but maybe it's true. <laughs> and, and actually, in a number of cases, what has actually happened is that the website has detected that you've been away, you've come back, you're now in a mood to buy that room. You're probably bored with looking. You'd probably pay a bit more. So they offer you a room at a bit more, and they make a bit more profit. And these sorts of algorithms use all kinds of, of data. I mean, some uh, online shopping websites, for example, use your location, which they can get from your IP address, and charge different prices depending on whether there are discount shops within easy walking distance of where you live or where you're currently surfing from. And of course, that discriminates against people who live in particular locations. And some of those people, um, some of the algorithms that are doing that discrimination um, are machine learning algorithms, which will have found things that correlate to people who are prepared to pay a bit more for goods and therefore you, you charge them higher prices. And some of the things that they're using within those algorithms that they've learned to use because they correlate to people who are less price sensitive perhaps, maybe um, protected personal characteristics that it would be illegal to use openly. But even the, even the website may not realize that their algorithms are actually discriminating unlawfully against particular classes of people based on criteria that they should not be using, but which just happen to correlate to something that perhaps might have been a legitimate reason for, for that discrimination. So, the personal data that is, is available to an increasing number of commercial sites is being used for an increasing range of commercial purposes. And that's, that's the point I, I really want to make. The, even if some of the examples seem completely benign, the future may not be as benign as the past. And and almost finally, uh, let's just look at how much your data is worth to, to criminals. Um, that's, that's the kind of prices that, that people are charging. I'm more if you've, if you've got, got more money. Um, these are relatively recent figures and of course um, it will vary fairly substantially. The market gets flooded every time there's a major hack and a lot of 
of websites get uh, a lot of credit card details get get taken. There, in, in just over the summer, in fact, within the last few days, uh, there has been a report that that um, a large number of shops using a particular um, online sales software uh, have been infected with a, with a malicious JavaScript, which is skimming credit card details uh, when, when people go, go to, the, uh, to, to check out their, their shopping basket. Uh, and I, found a, I saw a report on the BBC, actually, about this just two or three days ago, and, and went to look at the underlying report. And from that, I tracked through to the people who'd done the scan. And, and from that, I actually found on, on GitHub the, the list of all the shops that they had, had found using their, their scanner, because they, what they'd done was they discovered this JavaScript. And then they put a, a fairly characteristic chunk of the JavaScript in, into a search engine and gone looking for all the websites that had got that JavaScript embedded on them. Um, I looked for all the, I, I then did a, a search to see which of those were co.uk websites. And um, I, I got more than 100 um, that were co.uk websites. I don't know how many more than 100 because I gave up at that point. Quite early on was, was a website that uh, I have been using fairly recently for buying yeast and flour because I bake my own bread uh, online. And, and that's why my credit card details were, were stolen. I've been wondering because I had my credit card details used fraudulently to buy World Cup tickets when the World Cup was on, and, and flights even, hotels. Uh, I got all the money back, bank, bank paid out, no trouble at all. Um, but then I, I got a new card, and, and within a fortnight, uh, the new card had been, had been compromised. And, and it was that shop. So I, I went to the shop, and I pointed out to them that they'd got this problem, and they fixed it. And, and I've got hold of the, the website that does the scanning, and I've re-scanned the shop, and I'm now happily buying things from them again. Uh, and we shall see whether actually there's a, a deeper compromise in the website. But it, it is interesting, I think, that there are serious issues out there, and, and a wide range of, of commercial shops are being compromised to steal this, this sort of data. So the, the problems are not going away yet, and we, we just have to hope that the new um, National Cyber Security Centre that, that is, uh, is just opening up by uh, Victoria uh, will actually be able to make some serious impact on, on the, uh, the threats that are out there. So, in conclusion, what have I said? Your, your time and your personal data are both very valuable to commercial companies. They can be, be monetised. And the amount of data that they are collecting is already surprisingly large, and, and it, it creates power. And it creates power that is an unprecedented power for targeting. And there's always been advertising targeting. You know, people put their adverts in the kind of magazines that they think the people who want to buy that particular colour of Ferrari are likely to be reading, that's, that sort of thing. But, but the big data analysis means that you can target people right down at small groups with particular overlapping sets of interests. And as I say, that's potentially fairly benign um, for advertising purposes. It's being increasingly used to, to target voters in, in um, political campaigns. Uh, Starting in America is, is certainly happening in the UK increasingly now. And, and it, it creates a, an interesting phenomenon because free services, we, we all use them. And they've got to be paid for somehow. And if we fight back by using ad blockers and take their revenue away, how are they going to be able to afford to keep offering us the free services that we want? So there's a, a tension here that we haven't worked out yet because things are changing very fast on, on the internet and, and things are running ahead faster than, than regulation and, and government action could, could possibly affect. And of course, it's all international. So really, this is all in flux. 
And, and the one thing you can be sure about is that the internet in five or ten years' time will not look like the internet that we've, we've got today. It, it's going to change quite significantly for this and, and a range of other reasons. And, and in, I'd finally just, just like to encourage you to, to engage in, in the um, conversations about two Acts of Parliament that are currently, two bills that are currently uh, before Parliament, uh, the, the Digital Economy Bill and the Investory Powers Bill, uh, both of which have some, some interesting things to say about the way in which personal data will be exploited um, by government departments and, and made available uh, and by the activities that, that may be undertaken in, in looking into that personal data uh, by a range of different agencies for a variety of different reasons. So you know, if I've alerted you to some of the issues so that you, you read those draft bills with, with a slightly different view of the world, then, then I've done the job I came here to do tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.